Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today's episode is going to circumambulate around an emerging topic of interest, Jung's uh, secret erotic life. And we've come into some new information from our colleagues in Switzerland that there has been a recent discovery of Jung's erotic stamp collection. And this is creating a bit of a fervor in the community, partially because the research has not fully emerged, but much like the Red Book and the Black Books, it feels like another revelatory extension of Jung's canon of considerations that undoubtedly did, in fact, influence the development of his work. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really going to change how we view Jungian thought. I mean, I think this is really significant. Because you could imagine him just as he had those small figurines that he was playing with in his childhood, we now have another image into these small representative erotic images that similarly he was spending an awful lot of time alone meditating on. Exactly. It reminds me of the mannequin that he had as a yes, child that he kept right? in the little, uh, what was it, like a matchbox or something, mm-hmm. and he kept it tucked away and it was so precious to him. And now, you know, here here we go. There's, there's, uh, there's this other iteration of that that apparently he was engaging in more toward the the middle of his life. Joseph, why don't you tell us more about this discovery? Well, let me just jump in here for make a point of clarification, because I believe it's being called uh, the Milkmaid series, uh, so that when it finally is published, uh, people will be able to identify the title of this book. I don't know if it'll be as extensive as the Red Book or the Black Books, but keep an eye out for the Milkmaid series. And it was discovered um, in the tower at Bowling and Jung's private retreat. Which, which of course, is very interesting because the tower was so representative of personality number two Hmm. and this other highly private spiritual part of himself connected to the voice of the deep. So my understanding is This is something that was, in fact, known in Switzerland. It's the 1948 Milkmaid series um, that was secretly printed and um, distributed, particularly among men in that status in the culture. And they were particularly salacious images depicting inappropriate Mm -hmm. barnyard activities. What What's fascinating mm-hmm. to me is the archetype here of the milkmaid and that Jung, because he was such an incredible researcher across cultures uh, all around the world, uh, that there were milkmaid barnyard stamps made in uh, something like over 50 or 60 countries around the world. 
putting the milkmaid into a whole new archetypal perspective. Well, when I think about the milkmaid, I think about the relationship between the feminine and uh, the production of milk and into this tremendous ancient world where the feminine and the milk and the ancient goddess, which we might even think of as Hathor, are still thrumming through the Swiss culture, or really oh. through the European culture. Joseph, Joseph, uh, can you say that again? <laughs> thrumming. I know, I say it all the time. I don't know, I can't stop saying it. Well, it is a very libidinous uh, series of images, that's for sure, and something that I think anyone who's interested in Jungian thought theory and history uh, will find uh, incredibly resonant. But I, I don't want to lose sight of the bovine side of this archetype, because as we know, all archetypes are bipolar. So we might hypothesize that the milkmaid is one polarity and that whether it's Hathor or just bovine principles in general, that's the other polarity here. Mm, well, the mm -hmm. idea of an, the emerging bovinian dimension of mm -hmm. Jungian psychology, yeah, which yeah. has really been missing, I think, for a long it's, time. It's been missing in the culture. Absolutely. And I think Melanie Klein tried to resurrect that in her theory about the good breast and the bad breast, but she did not have that archetypal dimension of the mm -hmm. utter. The good yeah. udder and the bad udder, the yeah. dry udder yeah. and the full udder. Yeah. Joseph, that is just, I'm so glad that you lifted that up because I, I think that that is utterly critical. I'm having a harder time here. I think the masa confusa here that we uh, are all of a sudden finding ourselves immersed in uh, with barnyard imagery and, and mother's milk and Kleinian theory um, and all the bovininity that we're finding ourselves. I'm, I have to say, I'm, uh, I'm just feeling a little constellated. Well, you have a personal story about milking. Yes. Uh, which was part of both a traumatic, um, difficult period of your yes. childhood when you were sent out to work and earn for the family. But, but tell us a little more about that. Well, I think what's not being appreciated here is the resonance uh, with my uh, personal history of, of growing up on a, a dairy mm. farm <sighs> and mm. what, what the lived experience of uh, being a milkmaid is really like. Yeah. Of, of getting up at 4 or 4.30 in the morning and then cow after cow after cow and so much pulling and squeezing and squeezing and pulling. Uh, it really is uh, constellating some of my early childhood unmetabolized and as yet unintegrated shadow experiences. Well, I'd like to hear, much like the play Equus, what kinds of dark impulses might you have been left holding, you know, I mean, after the 30th oh. cow has left the stall, I can imagine your hands are in pain, you're confused, you haven't eaten yet, the cows are the priority, you're a child being deprioritized in that environment. Yeah. The suffering that you went through working yeah. at, at five and six years old. Yeah. And then we're in, you know, all of this milky terrain. And there's, there's just so much milk, and no one ever appreciates the dark side, the shadow side of milk. I mean, it looks white, uh, and it is white, but, oh my goodness, the underbelly, you should pardon the expression, is uh, really poignant. And the dark side is the souring of the milk. Oh, that's yeah. a, you know, I, right. Yeah. That that smell, that decayed protein mm -hmm, smell, because mm -hmm. everything's getting milk's getting sloshed out of the pail, and yeah. there's milk all over your hands and your clothes. And as the hours go by, I can just imagine that that combination of it being both life giving and disgusting at the same time. That it's a visceral mm -hmm. experience and an experience of tremendous salutio. Yes, uh, from an alchemical just, perspective, absolutely. I'm I'm so br I'm so glad that you brought in the alchemical lens on this because you know I have to think that we're in the realm of the putrefactio at this point. Well, that's an interesting thing the, the, because when we think about it alchemically, when the milk turns to cheese, mm -hmm. it does go through both a certain kind of decaying process, 
but also does become the precious thing if done correctly. Yeah, well, that's that's a real image of coagulatio. Yes, exactly. Also, you know, I think just the visual image of all those curds um, yeah. is such a big part of the alchemical process. Mm -hmm. The curds and the whey, of course. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So all of this enormous spectrum of of thought and, and antiquity, all being captured in these small commemorative stamps that were made in 1948, and the iconic value of the milkmaid as a kind of hero of the Western European culture, the one who takes the primordial essence from the great mother, extracts it, and then makes it palatable to support the entire community. It's an immensely important archetype. Absolutely. And I can imagine this compensated for his rather uh, spiritualized and somewhat frightening biological mother. Mm -hmm. You know, his mother was um, a member of the spiritualist church, and uh, there are these stories of him of her being in a trance state and showing up at the threshold of a door, making strange, frightening pronouncements. And I could imagine as a child, the fear of that driving him into the arms of the archetypal milkmaid. Oh my goodness. Joseph though, I just, I just want to clarify something. Cause I, I feel like this is a place sometimes where, where you go and, and I understand, I understand why you go there, but uh, it, it seems like you're kind of flattening the experience of the feminine mm. there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to encourage you to kind of keep a broader understanding of the mm -hmm. feminine mm -hmm. and not to try to uh, just break it down between, you know, the mother and the milkmaid. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. feminine psychology is it's more complex than that. I think that's fair. I think that uh, I'm really caught in the kinesthetic uh, resonance of the hands grabbing the teats and working them firmly, just as you were talking about, Deb, or you were inferring that. And you're right, to, to create a psychology that's, that is that derivative, that that's really all that there is around the bovination of the psyche. You're, I think you're right. Uh, there are certainly more dimensions to yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm still not quite sure you get what I'm saying, though. I mean, I, yeah. I think focusing on the teats, Joseph. That's a very phallocentric way of seeing the world. Hmm. Say more about that. Well, it is kind of a concretization, and I do appreciate what Lisa is saying about the the. Oh, I can't even say the word. Uh, the phallic elements here. I think are being overemphasized, that's all. Well, I think from a feminist perspective, to, to even suggest that the feminist psychology could be reduced down to the idea of the teat, the milked teat, right? That's, the, that's yeah, of course, offensive, And right? I also, the thing is that what I, what I want you to do is not see it through the lens of the hands on the teats. I want you to imagine that you are the teat. That, I'm, I'm having a very... Um, there's kind of chills coming up my back right now. You're really thrumming, aren't you? Well, I am, but just imagining myself standing there with these enormous cosmic hands kind of grabbing me mm. and squeezing downwards so that I kind of excrete something life-giving, which is probably both uncomfortable and an act of sacrifice and yet driven by this instinctive need to nurture life. Yeah, yeah. And now now I think you understand the feminine the feminine principle at work here. It, I feel it in my I feel it in my body. Yeah. That's profound. It it's numinous actually. I did want to bring up a, a rather fascinating synchronicity because this revelation of the erotic stamp collection was brought forward by somebody that you guys met when you were at the IAAP conference, um, Jaeger Schmollenberger, who is the researcher that had yeah. discovered the stamp yeah. box behind some old papers in Bollingen Tower. And you guys have a story about meeting this person. Well, he was a presenter at um, the international conference in Vienna uh, that Lisa and I and many, many other people attended. Uh, and he hinted 
uh, but we didn't quite have a real frame of reference for it. He hinted at the discovery of Jung's uh, secret stamp collection in Vienna, although his presentation was about something altogether different. The story that I'd heard, though, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that at the end of this rather erudite lecture, he, he sat there and held the uh, command of the group. He looked at them wryly. He lifted his hands up and made these strange milking gestures for several minutes, which, of course, was both compelling and frightening to the audience, and then whispered into the microphone, there's more to come. It, it was a really riveting moment. That did happen? Or is that just like folklore? You actually saw him do this? Well, um, it was right at the very end, and I had ducked out, but I heard about it from all kinds of people. It was, it was very mysterious. And, and now we know what was gestating this, this incredibly uh, burdensome secret that he was pregnant with at that moment that just kind of claimed the room in this gestural yeah. way. He was already milking this material yeah, of the, awesome. of the milkmaid. And I think what had happened is that, as we all know, uh, one can really be possessed by a powerful archetype, you know, like the archetype of the milkmaid. It's, these are things that really uh, permeate the boundary between the archetypal world and the collective unconscious and the world of, of ego boundedness. And I think he was just so immersed uh, in this material that yeah, it, it it's took really over. Swimming, swimming in it. And perhaps that's a good time to switch to a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here is a, a dream um, from a 26-year-old man who is a roofer. I am running down a back alley and see a slightly opened door. I'm running for my life and jump inside, bolting the door behind me. Inside, it's the back room of a smoky bar. I try to walk confidently through the room to find the front door. A short bearded man in a three-piece suit looks intensely at me while he slowly pulls a huge blunt out of his pocket. It's at least eight inches long and really thick. He nods and asks if I'd like a hit. I'm tempted, but I need to get out the door. He places the blunt on a small, low table and takes out a cigar knife just like my grandfather's and chops off the tip of the blunt. For some reason, I feel faint. As he clamps the blunt in his teeth, I run out the door. I'm home in the kitchen with my fiance, but now she looks different, having gained a huge amount of weight. I sit at the dining room table while she slowly peels a banana, strip by strip. It takes forever, but I keep staring at it. All peeled now, she smiles. I know she'll make me a banana split. She walks to the counter, winks, and throws it in the blender. I scream and try to turn off the blender, but it's too late. I'm upset and try to leave, but long black ropes wrap around my leg and pull me across the kitchen floor. There's a huge hole in the floor. The strands pull me in. I know I'll drown, so I fight real hard. I wake covered in sweat. Mm. Wow, mm. this is wow, that's such powerful imagery. It's so kinetic. Archetypal. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to read the context for us? Oh, uh, it says um, that his father, he's divorced his fifth wife this week with a big custody battle and that the dreamer was pulled into the middle of it. Uh, he says that he proposed to his girlfriend three days ago. She accepted and he's happy to be with her. And also, he um, says that he's been living in his father's basement since he was 15, and it's been hell. He says, I finally feel like my life will begin when I get married. I'm new to Jungian stuff, and I really like your podcast, which is a great indication about the character of this dreamer. And he, wants, he says, what, what does this dream mean? And we're here to tell him. Yeah, absolutely. 
I would like to start with the dream setting. Okay. Because I feel really um, so often, really the the whole dream is like a holographic image. It's right there in the dream setting, and this one um, is really resonant. Uh, so the dream setting is right at the beginning. I'm running down a back alley and see a slightly opened door. Wow. Wow. I, I know. It's big, there's, right? There's so much in that. First of all, he's running, and then there's a back alley, and our dreamer misspelled mm. alley. So he mm. wrote, he, I know, he wrote ally. Mm. And I think what one of the things we haven't emphasized enough in our dream interpretation is uh, how significant misspellings can be. Well, well, I mean, really, it's a Jungian slip, right? Mm -hmm. It's a Jungian slip. So if we think of it as running down the back of an ally, huh. as, huh. right? Oh, yeah, that's really good. That's yeah. big. Yeah. 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 And then a slightly opened door, which is such an evocative image. God, it's so poignant. Well, there's something about coming in through the back door, mm -hmm. you know, like the back part of the body in some fashion. Mm. So coming right. in up through the unconscious into the kind of dark and mysterious place. And the alley is generally the place of refuse, the place where the things are eliminated. Yeah. So there's a whole. Uh, so there's kind a of, lot of anal imagery. Just that's what I was thinking. Yeah. It's implied, and yeah. the dreamer probably yeah. will feel self-conscious about it. But I think we we may be leaning into Freud's anal stage work. Yeah. That's... Although from a Jungian point of view, wouldn't we just say that that's shadow? I I don't know about the Freudian interpretation here. Although I I certainly find it interesting. You know the physiology and integrating Freud into into some of this could really be meaningful. But but I think you're right about shadow, the back alley, the back of things, the stuff that we don't want people yeah. to see as in the front of something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm really struck in this dream. I mean, one of the really strong images is this blunt. And and I feel <sighs> like, you know, the dreamer doesn't give any association for that at all. And you know, sometimes we can really pull on a dominant kind of collective association with an image like that. But but this one, I'm just feeling kind of stumped. Mm -hmm. And I, I really wish we had this dreamer here because I'd, I'd love to know, you know, is he a mm -hmm. smoker, for example? I mean, he mentions his grandfather. Was his grandfather a smoker? I mean, it's just, it's it, it feels like a very powerful, muscular image. But I, I don't know that I can really say much about it without the dreamer here with us? Well, you know, I agree with you, Lisa. Um, but I'm also thinking you might be making a little much of this blunt. I mean, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Well, it is, it is this amalgam of both the cigar, which is a kind of traditional use of tobacco, but interestingly, blunts are uh, made of marijuana, and there are enormous amounts of marijuana that are wound sometimes in tobacco leaves to create a cigar-like object um, so that an enormous amount of marijuana can be stored in this kind of smokable form. But, but we do wonder about what it's like for him to, to handle this very thick eight-inch blunt in his hand and what kind of a feeling mm -hmm. that that might evoke in him yeah. or a feeling in those who are observing him. Right. Inserting that into the mouth and inhaling greatly and sucking yeah. upon it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really hard to imagine what that might evoke. I, don't, I mean, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm being overly influenced by the milkmaids because I'm back at the teats and the no, calves and nursing at the teats. Yes. Right? I know. I was in exactly the same place. And I'm thinking, you know, I think we're on, you were on to something with uh, the Freudian uh, interpretations uh, that this dream lends itself to. Uh, and then this is echoed. I mean, there's a doubling of the dream image with the banana, don't you think? I think that's taking it a little far, Deb. I mean, I, I'm not sure that there's really a connection there at all. You know, I, I think I think the banana says much more about the archetypal feminine and the nature of the split between the feminine and the masculine in this dreamer psyche. Well, which is almost like that wordplay that the dream provides the split. 
and also the wordplay and the word blunt, by the way. I mean, there may be mm-hmm. something very blunt, right. direct, yeah. mm-hmm. unsophisticated that's being mm-hmm. said in the dream. I don't know. I think you guys are really not uh, seeing the sort of masochism that is uh, implicit in these images of, first of all, you know, with the blunt, he takes off a cigar knife, just like his grandfather's, and chops off the tip of the blunt. And then that is followed by peeling the banana strip by strip. I I don't know what you're getting at, Deb. I don't know. I think I'm thinking about early trauma here. Oh, God, yes, Mm. of course. Trauma. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It could also be saying something about the religious function of the psyche. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's something, there's really something here about the nature of instinct, I think, and his, maybe the dreamer's uh, relationship with his in- instinctual aspect of himself. Uh, but there's also, you know, I, I have this predilection for optimism that um, when the banana is thrown into the blender, uh, the dream ego screams and tries to turn off the blender, but it's too late. Um, but I'm thinking that that could also represent a homogenization of these horrific images and then a kind of possibility of metabolizing well, them. Well, it's, it's a real relativization of the ego, I think. Mm-hmm. But if we yeah. think about that, what might be a very large banana, maybe it's the same eight inches and in, as thick as a cigar, and to oh, imagine right. that he would not be able to ingest, you know, let something that large slide down his throat would just be uh, overwhelming. So there's something benign about the feminine making it palatable and just as you said, turning it almost into another kind of milk, right? If you were to blend a banana maybe with water, it would turn into a kind of a sticky sluice, which then would be something that, you know, he'd be able to to drink with uh, less of a kind of an intrusive feeling of the entire banana going down. Yeah, that's, I think Joseph. I think that's just brilliant. I really, I really do. I think you really put your finger on something there. So the dream ego, often having the least reliable attitude in the dream, may be underappreciating the great mother. She reminds me of a kind of Venus of Willendorf figure in the mm-hmm. kitchen, yeah, who is taking the the raw banana and transforming it into something else, something that can be much more easily metabolized. And more in the realm of the feminine, making it yeah. more of a milky su- substance mm-hmm. rather than this other kinds of mysterious thing it might have represented. Mm-hmm. Right. It really um, harkens back, I think, to an early developmental stage uh, that this dreamer may need to recapitulate uh, in order to integrate and metabolize uh, an early trauma. Yeah. Well, as usual, I think we've been just brilliant with this dream and we have just put our finger right on the key complexes of this person. And I'm I'm sure that he'll be overwhelmed with gratitude at our perspicacity and sagaciousness. Well, we we hope that he does appreciate it and that to know that we're with him, that there's obviously a positive potential in all of these images and that you are on a journey to a kind of life that you have aspired for, this new life with your wife, Mm -hmm. this young wife, this new life rising out of the basement of your psyche and into the light and the the brilliance of the Rising out of the back alley of the psyche. Rising Mm -hmm. out of the back alley. It's a perfect, this dream perfectly uh, outpictures the individuation journey. And we can see that this dreamer rising up from the back alley and the basement of his life, uh, bursting into- Blunts uh, and bananas. Blunts, bananas, and the connuctio with his girlfriend and fiance. Yeah. That's great. From all of us to all of you, happy April Fool's Day. We hope you enjoyed our shenanigans and look forward to having you with us later today when we'll explore the archetype of the fool.